we have a heavenly father that knows what we need. Did you just hear that? When does he know what we need? Really? Lorraine better read it again. He knows what you need before. He knows what you need before. And knowing that, knowing that is key to understanding the passage that we're reading today. We are in uh, the book of Matthew, and if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're in the book of Matthew chapter 6, and uh, it, it is the place where Jesus is giving his manifesto, and uh, this, this manifesto is important for us to take note of because the fact is that, that uh, he is teaching. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we know this as the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so Jesus has a teaching situation in which the people of the land are getting an idea of what this new young rabbi is going to be teaching. He's taught these things before, but this is the time when Matthew chooses to condense them down into a sermon. And in this time, Jesus is teaching and he is saying uh, in response to the question that is given by his disciples to ask him as their rabbi to teach them to pray, he tells them, this is how you are to pray. First of all, let's just review the fact that the context is that he says, I don't want you. So he actually starts with the don'ts instead of the do's. He doesn't want us to pray like the hypocrites. Now, um, think in your mind what uh, your version of a hypocrite is. Uh, mine has taken on a cartoon character. I now call it a hypocriter. So there's a cartoon character in my mind that is a hypocriter, and I do not want to be a hypocriter. But a hypocriter uh, is, is this, this animal, this person, this thing that claims to be something and claims to, to be connected in a certain way and then acts differently. Jesus says in the beginning of this presentation, he says, I don't want you to be like. So as a disciple of Jesus today, please understand that, that he is wanting us to do certain things and he is not wanting us to do others. Uh, it is difficult, it is very difficult in many, many respects to hear the teaching of God and think that it is always positive. In this moment, we, we need to realize that he does come to us and he says, as he did directly to the individuals whom he referred to as the hypocrites, basically the people who knew, or in his mind, should have known because they were the ones who had read. They were the ones who had studied. They were the ones who, who knew what God asked of his people, and yet they did not do it, nor did they act like they knew in the first place. This is the sadness, in some respects, of the context of this teaching that Jesus gives. I don't want you to be like those individuals who pray, and really it's all about them. It's all about them. But it's interesting that we should be saying that at the beginning of this particular piece of the disciples' prayer because it sounds very much like we're saying to God that we want him to do something for us. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the thought that our rabbi, Yeshua, is teaching us today and as we come to understand it, I believe that we can spread the joy that he would like us to have. How many of you re remember the fact that the Bible teaches that joy is a gift? If you go home with nothing else today, that's the pearl of wisdom you can go home with. I believe that the Constitution has been made in this United States for the pursuit of happiness. So in America, we... We have this great country where we are given the opportunity to pursue happiness. And as, as the movie showed that was named after this phrase, 
not sure that everybody actually catches happiness. But with the power of God in our lives, he can give us joy. It's a gift. And actually, there are those of us, myself included, who could tell you that even in the midst of pain and suffering in this world, you can have joy. So therefore, it's different. In my mind, it's very different to uh, happiness. Let's back up just a moment and say that last week we said, Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Martin Luther King is quoted as having quoted someone else. You know, so when you watch individuals, sometimes they get their stuff from other people too. And he said, the moral arc, the moral arc, in other words, the trajectory, the direction of the universe is long and it bends toward justice. Justice in this context, I believe, is the thing that we have talked about now twice. The last two weeks I've wanted to bring forward the idea that the, I, when, when we say our Father whom are, who, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy will be done. We're talking about the, house, the householder. We're talking about the person in charge of the house. We're saying this person is this individual, this God that we're calling Father, and that his household, his realm, is something that we would like to be part of, and that we believe the way in which he orders his house is what we would like to see happen in our world. That is, as I said last week, that, that, that's, a, that's a categoric political statement. And we're going to be continuing along those lines this morning. And, and so as we think of the idea of justice, we realize that this is a particular ordering of the household that we are praying about. So I, I know that many of us know this prayer by heart. In fact, we grew up with it. It was one of the first prayers we were taught. And we can just say it but I'm hoping that, that as a result of this series this month that we will be able to say it now with so much more understanding and maybe take a little time with each one of these key, these key words. So here we go. We've talked about name. We've talked about kingdom. And we've talked about your will being done. And so we have come, in many respects, we have come to the core of this prayer. Because, you see, there are these three words, these three key words at the beginning, and then we get to the middle, and we are talking here about participation. Because, you see, as far as, as uh, this prayer and, and, and Jesus' intent is concerned, he is interested in involving us, he is interested in involving us in creating this new world. So we say, we say in the prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we think about that statement, we are actually saying whatever's going on in heaven, however heaven is run, however heaven is governed, the justice that we see in the kingdom of God in heaven, we want that same justice here. We want that same organization, that same householder rule here on earth. And we're basically saying we would like to participate in helping that to become a reality. God invites us to be a partner with him in making earth and heaven more and more the same. Now, I don't know if you have really stopped to think about that, but the, the ramifications of that, the, the outgrowth of that statement can and should, I believe, have a radical effect on how we view our world today. And I'm gonna to say, especially 
because we call ourselves Adventists. And even more especially, because we claim to be worshiping the Creator God on the day that He created. So you see why it's really important for me to say, watch out! We don't want to be hypocrites. Because we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. And, 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 and if we are going to call ourselves that, then we have to understand what the Lord's Prayer is saying here, that, that we are actively involved, we are being called, and now we're actively involved in wanting what is happening in heaven to also be what happens on earth. Some frustration and anger boils over in situations that we see around us, sometimes in, in, in violence, and we want no part of that. However, we see how people are affected by things that are, how shall, I, how shall we say, the wrong ordering of things. How many of you, uh, just, just, you don't have to raise your hand because I, I don't want you to be embarrassed at all, but... I'm certain that there are those of us in this very room right this very second that were adversely affected in 2008 with the housing crash. I know people who lost their homes in this town and now are living in very different circumstances and are trying to you know, work their way back to where they were before. When you stop to think that is a, a situation that exists in our world today and thousands upon thousands of people were very adversely affected, we can be frustrated about that. We can say, this is not just. And we can yearn, as this prayer indicates, we can yearn that what is true in heaven the justice, the way that the house is organized in heaven can also be the way that it is organized here on earth. Injustice is causing a huge amount of frustration. This phrase is an, is an offering up in some respects of our life for what it could be. And it is also a declaration of the fact that we would like it to be something that we help to bring into existence, that we would like to participate in it. So really, you could say that the first part of this prayer is an antidote. So if you want a prescription this morning, here's Dr. Jesus, and he's prescribing an antidote to sarcasm and cynicism. Uh, uh, it, cynicism is so difficult to deal with, my friends. I, 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 I'm going to confess to you this morning that it is probably something that I struggle with a lot. It is really hard not to be cynical in this world, not to just say, you know what? It really doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. But this prayer comes along, and Jesus tells his disciples, pray that what is true in heaven can also be true here on earth that his will would be done, that he would be in charge of the house, not only in heaven, but here on earth. It comes as an antidote to cynicism. It's, it's an acknowledgement that there is a calling upon humanity to unite heaven and earth. I don't know if you stop lung in your prayer life to pray that but Jesus our rabbi is is teaching us today and he's teaching us that 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 feeling of cynicism that that feeling of upsetness and frustration with the situation that we see not only locally not only nationally but also internationally these are feelings that we can take to God and we can pray Lord we want heaven to be here on earth. We want heaven to be united with earth. So in the first half, 
as we're now halfway through this prayer. In the first half, we have three big words. We have name, we have kingdom, and we have will. So now we move into the second half of the prayer, and uh, we, we, we remember that name, kingdom, and will all are about God. Holy is your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So there is, a, there is, an, ascending, there is an ascending order, if you like, of these words. And it acknowledges that he is the holy source. He is the, the way that we would like things to be ordered, and it is by his will that things come to be. So now we go into the second half, and we have three words, and the two will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. But today we're dealing with the first of the second half, which all start with the pronoun our. O-U-R, our. Give us our bread, forgive our debts, and lead us, us not into temptation. So you have this ascending progression, and now it's another one, and it has to do with us as human beings. God starts with us, and he says, would you partner with me would you partner with me in bringing about a new world? The human and the divine mixed together. And so we start, give us. Give us is the first uh, two words of this, this next half of the prayer. And it sounds not polite. Um, I'm very small. I had this memory this week, so I'll share it with you. I'm very small. I believe I'm, I'm four years old, and I'm walking into the church where my dad has become pastor after we have moved from South Africa to uh, uh, Texas. We're at the college church, which is now at uh, University Church, Southwestern Adventist University College Church, and my dad is an associate pastor there. I'm barreling into church like any good four-year-old boy. I'm, 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 I'm coming through the door, and, and there's a lady coming out of the door. <laughs> and I bumped into her. And my natural response, the politeness that my parents from South Africa, born and raised in South Africa, had taught me was anyone older than you is auntie or uncle. End of story. I mean, if you're 70 and he's 90, he's uncle. Okay? So it's this form of politeness. And so as I bump into this lady, as I'm coming into church, I say, sorry, auntie. And, and, and she turns around. And of course, I, I probably had an accent too then. But uh, she, she turns around and she says, son, I'm not your aunt. So like, this, this, this little boy is very confused. He thinks I'm really his auntie. But I was just using this, you know, I, I see you're connecting, because I think in the Filipino culture and the Hispanic culture and many other cultures around the world like mine, the, there are these things that you do for people who are older than you. It's part of being polite. So when we see these two words in this next phrase of the second half of this prayer, give us, it's not please, it's not by your leave, it's not uh, if you would like, uh, sir. No, it's Jesus is teaching us, our rabbi is teaching us, and it's a little strange, you would think, now that he's talked about the, the householder as our father in heaven, and he's saying, this is what you say to him. Really? Oh, okay. Give us. It, it is an imperative. It's not, a, it's not like, if you would like. It's, give us. So, what's he saying? It's a command. It's, it's, it's intense. Give us today our daily bread. 
Now here's where we get to this key word in the first part of the second half of the prayer. Bread. I'm, I'm thankful to Eric, who, uh, who I work with on third Sabbaths, to, to provide bread. Okay, uh, let's uh, check. He, uh, well, give Vons a little cred. He went to Vons. Um, anyone know what this bread is? This is a, a, can you clear your throat with me? Because it's a challah bread. Okay, uh, you would look at it and, and maybe say challah, uh, but it's, it's a Hebrew word and it means challah. And it's the bread that is used uh, to open Sabbath. So this, this bread represents that. Here's, here's one of my favorites. Is this indeed, uh, let's see, this is an artisan bread round. Okay, sourdough. Ooh, very good. How many of you love sourdough? Okay, so you're going to order sourdough when you go to the restaurant. Good. This is the bread that uh, my wife, who is gluten-free, can actually eat sometimes because of the way that it is prepared. The dough is allowed to rise a number of times, and that process actually, for all you chemists out there, we have found in my wife's allergy actually to sugars, you didn't think that gluten-free people were actually allergic to sugar, that the sugars are broken down in the fermentation process that it results in sourdough. So uh, somebody found this out a long time ago, and uh, we just found that out, and Chris got a recipe for making our own sourdough. It takes time because you have to let the bread dough ferment and the sugars to be broken down, but we can actually eat sourdough. Okay, here's a, uh, I'm gonna call this the, well, what do they call it? Bread, okay. <laughs> Would you, okay, so what are you gonna, what are you gonna say? This one definitely has the word French written on it. And uh, I mean, it is the, the classic French baguette, okay, and um, I'm told that it is very difficult to make. Uh, to be a good maker of a baguette is, is, is uh, uh, quite a feat in baking. It's not an easy bread to make. You would think they make so many of them, they must be good at it, they must know how. Yes, but it takes a special baker, baker to make a really good Baguette, and, and this one, uh, I, I'm just going to call it an artisan loaf. Okay, here we have some Russian rye. Okay, for all those Central European background people that have checked your ancestry and were surprised that you're part Cossack. Okay, here it is, uh, Russian, Russian rye. Um, and for those who come from the Middle East and many other parts of that part of the world, pita, pita bread. Did you know, I, I, I was living in Israel, and I, I decided that this became a, a judge of the, the economy. It's a very good, good analogy uh, to, to, to give you. I would go out for a pita sandwich in Jerusalem. And in those days, literally the breads were twice as big as this. And they would cut them in half, put the falafel in, and then you would go over to the bar and you would put all your fixings in, and you were allowed to stand by the bar with all the fixings, and as you ate, you could put more fixings on. Now, as a young man uh, of, of 18, 19, I was very happy for that. It was a whole meal, and it only cost a few shekels. But as the economy changed, and actually while I was in Israel in the early 80s, uh, they actually changed to the new shekel, they devalued the old shekel down to 10% of the value of the new shekel, and suddenly the pita breads weren't the other size, they were this size. And you were getting half of a pita, and they only allowed you to go through the line once. So you see a connection between bread and the word economy. Bread stands for the economy of the world. Okay, a lot of you know what this is. Crunchy, crunchy, Guerrero. What does that mean? Fighter? Warrior? This is warrior bread. Watch out. Comes from Mexico. All right? Love tortillas made of corn. And of course, in a gluten-free household like ours, this 
is always around. Okay, there's another challah. And, oh, a fun one. How do you make this? This is lightly salted matzah. Okay, this would not be okay for Passover, by the way. Why? No salt. Okay, not, a, not supposed to have salt. But you can have matzah anytime you want if you're having some gefilte fish. What, what language am I talking here? Okay, this is from Israel. This is from the Hebrew tradition. This is uh, 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 from the same part of the world as, as pita bread, uh, Mediterranean, uh, specifically uh, Israeli. So I wanted, wanted to put out a sampling of bread because the idea that I want to put across is that here comes the prayer from the God that we are calling rabbi this morning in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. And he is saying that we should ask with a very emphatic tone in our voice in this part of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. This is a political word. It refers to economy. It refers to power. It refers to structure. Life is bound up in daily provision. Another trip that I took was into Moldova. Moldova is a tiny country that was uh, set up by the USSR, and uh, many of its plants for military and things like that ended up in Moldova. But Moldovans actually speak a language that is very similar to Romanian. And in Moldova, I found that there was an economy of plenty. It's just that they didn't have the transportation to get it to market. So are we thankful today for, was it Eisenhower? Who said, let's have a whole big system of highways across America. One of the reasons was military. The other reason was economy. So that we could get our produce to market. There were fields I saw in Moldova full of wonderful produce. Most of which was rotting in the field. Because people could not get it to market fast enough. Because the markets in the adjoining countries were not letting them sell their produce in the economy. Daily provision. A friend of mine used to run the uh, grocery section of a Walmart. She oversaw the unloading of two semi-trailers every early morning for just that one Walmart. Now, I was living on Vancouver Island, and those trailers had been literally come across on a ferry during the night. I would hear the ferry, uh, I would hear those trailers being taken down into Victoria at 2 and 3 in the morning. That ferry would get in, and those trailers would then be trucked down into Victoria, and she would be there to unload that truck of fresh produce for that one Walmart. Every day. Every day, you're talking about daily provision. I believe the planet is capable of producing enough food for all of us, but the major issue is that some of us are starving. So there's an issue with the way that the house is being run in our world today. I don't know if that disturbs you at all. I don't know whether you feel bad. I think that the reference that was made this morning to the little, the little thing that we do, which actually is very much appreciated, by the way, when you go to that grocery store and you pick up an extra box of cereal or you pick up an extra box of pasta or whatever it is that the food bank needs, we recognize at that moment that there are indeed neighbors in this town who may have to make a decision between rent and food, between rent and gas in their budget. So it's really nice to know that there is a food pantry here in Santa Clarita and that we can support it. That's a, that's a today thing. That's a, a thing that we can participate in when we think of this particular subject of bread and we think of provision. 
in Jesus' day, Caesar was in charge. And estimates are that in Palestine, there may have been a 90% tax. Okay, just let that settle in for a moment and then understand why they hated Zacchaeus and they hated Levi so much. A 90% tax. And then, with that background, understand how amazing it was that while Jesus is preaching to 5,000 men, not counting the women and children that may have been there, but 5,000 of these people who were being overtaxed by Caesar, and he provides with five, with, with a, with, with a lo five loaves and two fish. He provides bread makes that story a whole lot more interesting. And then at the end, to have, uh, to have 12, 12 baskets left over, one for each of the disciples who were the servers, if that wasn't the biggest statement that Jesus ever made to his disciples about the fact that I am the provider, I am the one who will make provision for you in your daily, in your daily life. And he does so with a little boy's lunch. A regular worker's lunch. Five pita breads, five little loaves, and, and two fish. The rabbis teach this, that we go back to the first mention of a word. The first mention of the word bread is in connection with liberation. Liberation from slavery. Yes, it's where the unleavened bread is made because you don't have time to let the bread rise. You're going to eat unleavened bread and roasted lamb. The quickest way to prepare is not to boil, it's to roast. So you put your traveling clothes on and you're getting ready to go and you, you're going to eat unleavened bread and roasted lamb and you're going to be waiting for the trumpet call for your tribe to get in line because you're leaving Egypt. This is the first time that we come up with the idea of bread and so it is that they leave out into the wilderness and pretty soon they don't have any more bread they don't have any more provision. And they cry to Moses and say, did you bring us out? Did God bring us out into the desert to kill us of hunger? And the next morning, there's this flaky stuff on the rocks. And they, they say, what is it? What is it? And that, my friends, is the Hebrew word manna, manna. They gave this particular bread from heaven. They gave this particular bread from heaven the name, what is it? What is it? <laughs> Remember, you see, when you eat this manna, and they did so for 40 years in the wilderness. Remember, you were liberated from slavery. You were provided for. Why did God do that, you might say? Because this is the answer that really just blows my mind. They were liberated so that they could be a people who would liberate others. So as you say with a very determined voice in, when you're speaking to God, give us this day our daily bread, you are saying, I want to be part of your economy. I want to be part of your household where you will provide for me. I accept this provision and I know that you are also going to ask me to then go out and provide for others. The same idea and the same Provisions. You're going to ask me, God, to go out and provide for others, to liberate them from their slavery as well.
Proverbs chapter 30 says something that uh, is a little strange. Give me neither poverty nor riches. What is Solomon talking about? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me only my daily bread. Now, the Hebrew teaching on this, the rabbi's teaching on this, basically says this. If I am rich, I may forget why I am rich. I may forget who made me rich. If I am poor, I may steal. And I may dishonor the one who has made me. So it's not about scarcity that we're talking about here. It's not about piling up, stockpiling. It's about having just enough. And my friends, this is a huge word for me. It's not actually in the prayer, but it comes under this heading of this word that we're talking about today, bread. It's about having enough bread. And if you were born in the 60s or if you were a teenager in the 60s, you know that bread was the word used for money. And it's appropriate in this, in this sense to say, what do you need to feel like you have enough? It's a huge word. It's a word that you can ask to somebody who is maybe in our social circle. You could also ask it of somebody who's in the Forbes 500. What is it to have enough? What is it to understand that when you make this phrase, when you, when you pray this prayer to God, you are saying, God, provide me with the enough that I need for today. And here's the kicker. He gets to decide what's enough, not me. So the, 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 the idea that many Christians have, that if I just trust God, he's going to give me whatever I want. This prayer, my friends, this phrase flies right in the face of that to say, yes, God is going to provide for you. He has the whole story of the people in the, in the desert. He has the story of the 5,000, and he provided for them, but he is providing for them daily bread. And the idea that is coming across here that you need to really grab a hold of is that he gets to decide what you need. And that's something I know that I struggle with, and I, I'm, I'm confessing that to you because... I have my ideas of what I need. I have my ideas of what is enough. And, 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 and there are temptations that come to me every day in Santa Clarita that what I have is not enough. In fact, I have this on good authority. The entire advertising industry is interested in helping you to feel that what you have is not enough. So you, you see why I'm saying that this prayer that Jesus is teaching us is revolutionary. It would, it would get you in trouble with Caesar to say, no, I'm not going to trust Caesar. I'm going to trust God to be my provider. We need to decide in the here and now what is enough. I won't go into the details that I wanted to for the sake of time, but I'm just going to remind us of our, the closing passage that that really kind of sums this up for me. It's a picture that I want you to have in your mind as you leave. A couple of people, one of them known as Cleopas, have been walking back from Jerusalem after the death, burial, and now resurrection of Jesus on the weekend. 
and they're talking to each other. Uh, biblical scholars are fairly confident that the person going with Cleopas is his wife. So we have a husband and wife, and they're going home, and they're talking about all of this, and, and, and they're, they're not understanding. And suddenly there's this third person that's walking with them. And as he's walking, he's listening to them, and he starts asking questions and playing dumb. That opens up the opportunity for them to just be absolutely incredulous. You don't know what's going on. Oh my goodness, you must be the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on. And so they tell him, they give him a testimony. This is what just happened. And then Jesus turns around and he explains the meaning of what just happened. Bible says here, Matthew says, he opened up to them the law and the prophets and he showed them how it all fit together. The Bible also says that their eyes were closed in the sense that they did not understand him. And my friends, it wasn't until they got around the table, they got around the table just like this. And maybe because he was the guest or maybe because it was just his habit, Jesus reached for that loaf, that small loaf, because these were not wealthy people, they were hospitable people. But they were not understanding the import of the events that had just taken place in their lives as followers of the Christ. If indeed this was Cleopas's wife that we're talking about, she was one of the few people who actually stood by the cross while Jesus died, while the other disciples went away. This is the same person. And now Jesus is sitting at her table. And it wasn't until he broke the bread. My friends, their eyes were opened and they realized that everything that he had said, the way that he had explained how everything fit together and how he was the embodiment of the Messiah, the one that they had so looked forward to, he, he was the one. They didn't even probably bother to finish much more of their supper. They got up and they left and they went and they told the disciples, he is risen. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I get pretty excited about telling people about Jesus. But I'm going to say, I'm going to get really excited about telling them, this is the God who has promised to give you your daily bread. That he is indeed the manna, the bread of life, and he is the coming king in which he says, I'm going to sit down with you at table and we are going to break bread together. And I believe, Eric, that it will be on our knees. We will be tossing our crowns that we do not feel we are worthy to wear. We will be tossing our crowns at the feet of the one who has made all of this possible, who is the living God known as Jesus Christ. And we will be saying, hallelujah, thank you, God, for providing for us completely and utterly everything that we need, not only for this life, not only in this valley of the shadow of death, but you have led us, you have led us into your presence where the whole universe knows that you are the one who makes the bread. Amen.